So we are going to learn about American heroes from Mr. Shirtliff and from Chappie, Reverend Kraft. Okay, campers, Mr. Shirtliff. Okay, thank you. Let me have your attention, please. Please be seated. All right. So after this class, we have the quiz, I mean the final exam, right? And everyone's going to max it out, I guess. Okay, well, how many people like history? Actually read history books? biographies, maybe watch movies, really into the history, okay? I had to wear this shirt that my son designed, History Matters, because it does. We see a lot of people out there in the world, in this country, that know absolutely nothing about history. What they know is from people like Howard Zinn. How many people know that name, Howard Zinn? Well, he wrote a, he was actually a communist. Now, 30 or 40 years ago, if a communist was writing a textbook for schools, it would have been rejected, out of hand. Because you have to assume a communist is going to lie. That's what they do. But Howard Zinn wrote a book called A People's History of the United States. And it is full of lies and it's full of hatred for America. Here's a man whose parents fled, fled Germany, I think it was Germany, in the 30s and came here and made a pretty good life. I mean, they, they struggled like a lot of people did. And instead of having appreciation for the country, he hated it, wanted to see it destroyed. And his book is in many, many government schools and even some prep schools and such, and it is full of absolute lies. And he wasn't even a historian. And I would say that most of these folks who buy into Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all these other anti-American groups are, have been weaned on that book. They'll say that, for example, Christopher Columbus was a mass murderer or a genocidal maniac. That's an outright lie. Even if... He, he was allegedly killed millions of people in two years. It would have been impossible. But see, there, sometimes people want to believe things. They want to believe what's false. So, um, also, uh, we know about this football, former football player, Colin Kaepernick. By the way, time me. Reverend Kraft and I are splitting the class, so give me, uh, what, 20, 25 minutes? 22.50. So, yeah, okay, well, well, it's 45 minutes long, so we'll, uh, give me about 25 minutes or so. Uh, so give me a final five-minute final warning. So um, <clears throat> we have been blessed with some great people in our country. And a little background, I started loving history as a young man. My dad was a World War II veteran. He actually met General Patton in Sicily. And I actually met his son when I was in Germany, right, uh, who was also a general. And as a result of my meeting him and my sergeant, he was impressed by my performance. I got a four-day pass where I went to Munich, so I'll never forget that. So, um, and we have, my family has a rich history in this country. I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. I can trace my ancestors back to the Mayflower. That doesn't make me any better than Professor Soon, who came here as an immigrant, or anyone else. Um, and because some of the best patriots are those who had come from other countries and realized what they have here in this country. I would think it was with... Um, Professor Suna, we were traveling somewhere together, and you said, only in America, you know, the opportunities and the generosity of the American people, and there's a reason for that. Now, as I went to high school, it was in the height of forced busing, a lot of racial turmoil, riots. I was fighting communists way back then, I mean, physically fighting communists, right? <laughs> and I won't go into that too much, but uh, I had a... Um, but my eighth grade history teacher in the government schools, Mrs. Wolf, I'll never forget her. And I don't know if she was a liberal or a conservative, but she loved America. She was wrong on one thing. She said that the Constitution up upheld slavery. Uh, the so-called three-fifths compromise, some of you might be, and you might have heard that. Well, actually, the states with large slave populations and uh, there, was, uh, there was some states, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, I believe, were the only two free states in 1787 when the Constitution was ratified. There was slavery in New York. There was slavery in uh, New Hampshire, too. Connecticut. There was slavery in, um, in Connecticut and New York and some other uh, northern states. In fact, Delaware. Anybody know Delaware was a slave state? It was a slave state while it was a member of the Union during the Civil War. Most people don't know that. So uh, anyway, she, uh, the, de the delegates from the states with large slave populations wanted to count slaves in the mix. In other words, what the purpose for the census in the Constitution was for representation in the House of Representatives. 
So the more people, that means the more members of Congress would represent that state. And the blacks did not, were not citizens and did not have a vote at that time in these states with large slave populations. But they wanted to count them as full people for the sake of the census. And the states with small or no slave population says, wait a minute, you're going to be overly represented, uh, represented here. There'll be more people with us that, that support slavery. So we'll do this compromise, three-fifths compromise. So that's, uh, that actually did not support slavery. It was just the opposite. But you see how easy it is to get the wrong, the wrong attitude. Now, I was the only white student in a class that was a black history class in my, my senior year in high school. Uh, it was an elective, and I wanted to learn about black history. You don't have to take a course in black history or African-American studies. You can pick up books. You can go online. YouTube and other places to get some really good history. And so I always had a keen appreciation of the great accomplishments made by black Americans. And I had an interesting story. When I worked in the post office for five years, and I was always a, an activist. And there was a liberal guy that I was trying to uh, convince to talk to. I had a book written by a former Black Panther. His name was Tony Bryant. He's since passed away. It was called Hijacked. He actually hijacked a plane to Cuba as a Black Panther, and instead of being welcomed as a hero, Castro put him in jail for 12 years, where he became a born-again Christian, and got out, came back to the United States, and what have you. So I was trying to educate him about patriotic Black Americans. He wasn't accepting it. So I met him, we, we about to, he was about to punch out at 4.20 in the morning. Uh, we used to work odd hours in those days. And uh, now this guy lived in the suburbs, and I had some of my Black co-workers around me that I was very friendly with. And uh, I said, well, did you read the book? He said, look, I'm not going to read that book. He said, you need to travel around the country to get a real perspective of the struggle of the, of the blacks and so forth and so on. I says, I've traveled around the country. I said, I understand. I've been to Mississippi. And in fact, at Mississippi, the people are great there. They're very friendly people there. And uh, then he said to me, well, you don't know anything about black history. So I started quizzing him on black history. He knew none of the answers. <laughs> not one. And my, my black friends, were just, they were high-fiving each other. And they said, sure, if you're cold-blooded, <laughs> it was great. And uh, I said, finally, I said, I got one more question to you, for you. I said, why did you white liberals give blacks the shortest month of the year for their Black History Month? And man, I tell you what, he didn't speak to me after that. But black history, I, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And you win people over, by the way. We celebrate black history, but actually, I don't believe that history should have a color to it. But I understand it. I understand it. What started off, it was a black history week back in the 60s and 70s uh, when uh, it was Lincoln's birthday and the birthday of, believed to be, of Frederick Douglass. We're not sure when he was born, but he would celebrate it in that week. So that started off as Black History Week, and it became Black History Month. But I believe history is every day. You learn things every day. And I'm learning new things all the time. Uh, so I want to share with you some of the things. Now, I have a book here, and I recommend you get it. This was written by a black historian. He was one of the early black historians, William Cooper Nell. And it was published in the 18, 1851. Anybody know where that's a picture? That's that, that depiction? Any uh, camper can tell me? Yes, sir. You put your hand up. Right there. You had your hand up first. Boston Massacre. Well, why, what's this got to do with black people? Christmas addicts, that's right. They were, now, I had another, uh, I had a, another co-worker in the post office. We were buddies, but he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And he said, well, all the history books are written by white people. You know, I says, okay, let me ask you a question. Name the black man that was killed at the Boston Massacre. He said, Christmas addicts. Now, name the white people. And he couldn't. <laughs> he said, okay, you got, you got me there. <laughs> so, uh, but he probably wasn't aware of this book. Uh, and I recommend you get it. It's still in print. And this is where I get some of the information for this, this projection here. Now, um, oh, there's another one. Yeah, it's called Patriots of Color, Black Patriots of the Revolution. Uh, and there's a lot, of, you say, a lot of good things out there, a lot of good history books. But I recommend those two. No, those two. Now, here's one of my favorites. Now, every... Uh, April uh, Patriots Day, which is always celebrated Monday, the week of uh, the actual date, April 19th. What year was the uh, Lexington, Battle of Lexington? April 19th. How does that poem go? Midnight Rider, Paul Revere, April. 
But hardly a man is now alive who ever met. Yeah, okay, 1775. This has a special significance since um, our learning center is about two and a half blocks from the green, and Reverend Kraft and his uh, dear wife Edith are the uh, resident managers of this place. But uh, there was a militia unit, and the militia unit had a slave by the name of Prince Esther Brook. And Prince Esterbrook was one of the men that was actually wounded on Lexington Battle Green. So when Colin Kaepernick tells you that the stars, the 13 flag star, a 13 star flag is somehow racist, what he's saying is Prince Esterbrook and those 5,000 or more black patriots that fought alongside their white counterparts, what they did was in vain. And he's a liar. So Prince actually, um, he was wounded at, at Lexington. When they do the reenactments, and I do recommend, we were actually were going to have an event. We were going to have a, a, do an overnight at the, at the house and watch the movie Johnny Tremaine. And Mr. Uh, where's, our, where's Mr. Belanger? Is he here? He was going to make popcorn, and we were going to have a great time. We were going to watch uh, the Midnight Rider Paul Revere to go to the Hancock Clark House, where they actually have a guy on horseback to reenact the event. And then we were going to take in the, uh, the, the Battle of Lexington, but they canceled all the events because of the, uh, the Wuhan virus. So um, anyway, <clears throat> an undated broadside from the time identified him as a Negro man, spelled his name Esther Brooks, and has listed him among the wounded from Lexington, Massachusetts. There is a, a monument that, to him that was put there oh, uh, recently. Born around 1741, he was a slave belonging to the family of Benjamin Estabrook, from whom he most likely took his name. And he, uh, he did get his freedom. He was from the Lexington militia, commanded by Captain John Parker. And there's a statue, that, there's a beautiful statue that's still standing, has not been torn down yet. And I know there'd be a lot of patriots, including Reverend Kraft and I, that will be guarding that if they ever try to, all right? The first to engage the British at Lexington and was paid for his participation in Cambridge detachment from July 17, 1875. The Essex Register of 25th April 18, uh, 1775 lists Prince Esther Brooks, a Negro man of Lexington, as having been wounded by the British troops at some time during the battles of Lexington and Concord. He enlisted in the Lexington militia in 1773 and served in, off and on until 1783. He did get his freedom. and. Um, his, uh, there's a nice little book that we have at the Lane House. You can buy probably for about $10. Heroes of the American Revolution, Prince Estabrook. And um, <clears throat> that's the, the monument that has not also been torn down. It's still there in Lexington. By the way, these people that are tearing down monuments, it's not just a Confederate monument. It's not just to Columbus. It's to our history. When communists take over a country, they completely eradicate the history of a country and how, how our history is in its statues, in its books, and so forth. So uh, the, man that de the man depicted here is actually the man who uh, put, uh, portrays him during the reenactments. Prince was probably in his mid-twenties when he was wounded. This gentleman is now in his eighties and I'm, I'm encouraging Reverend Steve to fill in for him because <laughs> he's still a young guy he's got <laughs> and maybe that will happen so that'd be kind of cool to watch Reverend Kraft and every year you have to get wounded Rev you can't flip the you, you can't flip the script okay and uh, our camp used to be uh, in Ringe, New Hampshire how many people remember the camp Toa Nippy well we would on the way on the way from our house we would always uh, pay honor and tribute to his to this his memory and there is his uh, very modest uh, gravesite in Ashby, Massachusetts, which is in central on the borders of, uh, on the New Hampshire border. And you see the little uh, to the left looks like a little lollipop. That's from the uh, Sons of the American Revolution, mentioning that he was a soldier in the American Revolutionary War. He did. He ended up. Um, did he did some? He spent some time in New York uh, fighting. And he again, a very courageous man. Caesar Robbins, who lived in nearby Chelmsford. Enslaved at birth in 1745 in neighboring Chelmsford. I know the Pikes uh, used to live right next to Chelmsford. Served in the French and Indian War at the age of 16. His owner received his payment on April 19, 1775, the first day of the Revolutionary War. He likely served at the North Bridge in Captain John Robbins' Act Acton Company. The North Bridge is where the Battle of Concord took place. Um, he was with forces that fortified Dorchester 
Dorchester Heights and marched to Fort Ticonderoga as part of Captain Zachary Fitch's company. He was probably emancipated, means he was freed, before or at the time of his enlistment. He settled in Concord, married twice, and had six children. Two of his grown children, Susan and Peter, become the first residents of this newly built house on the Robbins farm. And this is the, um, it's a little depiction of him here. And this is a replica of his house. If you go to the parking lot right before the Concord Bridge, some of you who have been there as a field trip probably remember seeing that. That was built within the last five or six. I think uh, Dr. Nace, I think, I, I think you saw that. We took you to the bridge and you almost fell. It was all icy. <laughs> so, now, this is someone who is very well, very little known. And I learned about him. I live in Boston and right on Beacon Hill, which is where the State House is, there's what they call the Black Freedom Trail. And did you know that there was an all-black militia in Boston back at that time? It was called the Bucks of America. And they were very honorable men. And Colonel jo and he, might, he may have been or probably was the very first officer. Now, he wasn't in the Continental Army. He served in the militia unit as a black officer, Colonel George Middleton. He was one of 5,000 African Americans to serve in, or we just say black African Americans, to serve in the military on the Patriot side of the Revolutionary War. Although scant evidence survives about his military service, Colonel Middleton served as the commander of the Bucks of America, a Boston-based unit of the Massachusetts militia. Few details have survived about Buck, the Bucks, only, only one of two all-black units in the war. After the war, Governor John Hancock, now who is John Hancock, anybody know? Same guy who did what? Yes. He what? Now stand up. I can't. He was the first one to sign the declaration, right? So he eventually became governor of Massachusetts, and so he presented him with he and his son with the flag. The flag still exists and is owned by the Massachusetts Historical Society. I saw the original. It is now on permanent loan to the African American Museum in uh, Washington, D.C., and I actually uh, had, I brought it with me, five minutes, okay, I brought it with me, but I must have somehow got lost in the shuffle, but it's, um, it's, it's quite a thing. Uh, on, there it is. There's the flag right there. And how many stars on that flag? Is that a racist flag? It's honoring these brave men. And that's uh, John Hancock, and his son, John George Washington Hancock. That's his initials there on the flag. And there's his home, which is still, it's a private residence now. It's still standing. Now, some of you remember going to, who's been to Bunker Hill in Boston? Yeah, some of you probably remember that we took a field trip there. And even Reverend Kraft made it to the top. <coughs> and Mrs. Kraft made it to the top. Salem Poor. Salem Poor was a slave owned by John Poor. Many New England families treated their slaves as live-in servants and near family members. And Salem Poor purchased his freedom in 17, uh, 1769 for 27 pounds, a, lar a fairly large sum at the time. He was married in 1771 and a son was born in late 74 or 75. And there he is depicted on a United States postage stamp. Who collects stamps in here? Any philatelists? And so there he was, a 10 cent stamp, gallant soldier, contributors to the cause. And there he is holding a musket. Let me skip that. Okay, and there's, there he, there's a depiction of uh, Salem Poor in this beautiful painting of the death of um, Joseph Warren, who was another incredible man. But, um, and he actually, he was a very brave soldier, and he... Um, I believe he shot Captain, he's the one that killed Captain Prescott. He was the leader of the, the British, uh, one of the leaders on the hill. Then is Prince Whipple. Prince Whipple was born in Ghana of comparatively wealthy parents when about 10 years of age he was sent by them in company with a cousin to America to be educated. An elder brother had returned four years before and his parents were anxious that their child should receive the same benefits. The captain who brought the two boys over proved to be treacherous villain and carried them off where he exposed them for sale. And Prince Whipple fought at the battles of Saratoga. I know that I know uh, not too far from uh, Pastor Wallace's uh, place in Delaware during the uh, War for Independence. His owner, General jo uh, William Whipple, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and an aide to General Washington. Although Whipple had been identified by some 
in, as the African American figure in the familiar painting of Washington crossing the Delaware is doubtful he was present on Christmas Eve. So, you know, when an artist paints something historic, something that happened years, uh, years before, there's a little historic license. So you can see in the, the, in the picture the uh, William, uh, the, what they believe was, um, was, the, uh, was the slave um, Prince Whipple. And there he was buried in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So um, I do, and, uh, if we get to the Civil War, of course, there's many, many other incredible. The 54th Regiment was the first all-black regiment that fought. And, you know, there's a beautiful um, statue, a monument, across from the State House in Boston. And guess what happened when there were riots, when the Antifa and Black Lives Matter people, they defaced this beautiful statue, honoring brave black soldiers. And that just tells you how twisted that the people who are doing this. And if they really knew the history, you would, they would go out of the way to make sure that this, the people, uh, uh, um, this unit is well known. So with that, I think I want to pass this off to my brother, with a, my brother from another mother, Reverend Stevie Kraft. <laughs> oh. Actually, one, one more thing. Juneteenth. Hello, what happened? Oh, it's okay. Juneteenth, uh, June 19th, most people had never heard of that event prior to a couple of weeks, or prior to a week, three weeks before June. All of a sudden, everybody's celebrating it. And the question is, where are your pictures from the June 2019 celebration? Not to be found. June 19th was uh, 1865, did not uh, uh, free the slaves. What happened was, Lincoln passed the Emancipation, Pro Emancipation Proclamation and that only freed slaves that were in the former Confederate states. Uh, it, the slavery didn't end until the 13th Amendment. Why? Isn't that what we said on CNN? Well, what happened was a, a, a Union general went to Galveston, Texas, whose name eludes me at the time, and he said, oh, by the way, you got, all you slaves are free because of the Emancipation Proclamation. Texas was a slave state. It was part of the Confederacy. We've occupied this area, now free. Well, there were four slave states in the Union. How many people knew that? Anybody know that? Oh, my son, right? A couple people right in. Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. There was still about 400,000 blacks slave, enslaved. So it wasn't until the 13th Amendment was passed, that's when slavery came to an end. So with that, hand it over to my brother from another mother. <laughs> By the way, the enemies of this country want a race war. Mm -hmm. We are not going to let them have one, okay? Yes. Truth was never, never more clearly spoken. And that's why me and Brother Howes, since I met him in 2009, been coming to camp ever since for the last 11 years, we've purposed in our hearts that we're going to stand for what is true and what is right. We're going to call the devil out as the liar that he is. People talk about race wars and the need for seminars on sensitivity training and racial reconciliation and diversity sensitivity trainings and all kinds of such nonsense. We always have to remember to go back to the word of God. The Bible tells us clearly that racial reconciliation was a done deal at Calvary. Jesus tells us through the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. He says, you had no hope and you did not know God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar away from God are brought near through the blood of Christ's death. Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jewish people and those who are not Jews into one people. They were separated as if there was a wall between them. But Christ broke down that wall of hate by giving his own body. You hear that, y'all? Yeah. Verse 15 says, The Jewish law had many commands and rules, but Christ ended that law. His purpose was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups. 
to make them into one body and to bring them back to God. Christ did all of this with his death on the cross. So what's that telling us here? Anything we need to know about anything is already an accomplished fact in the Word of God. Excuse me. I just heard Mr. Shirtliff talk about the 13th Amendment. You all brought your pocket constitutions, I hope, right? Take them out. Turn to page 25, where you'll find the 13th Amendment. When you get there, say amen. Page is on page 25. Amen. You there? Somebody keep me on point here time-wise with, uh, with the cue cards, okay? Amen. You all there? Amen. All right, 13th Amendment says, Section 1, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 13th Amendment was ratified June 6, 1865 at the close of the Civil War. Most people have no idea about the 13th Amendment. So you hear these race baiters, these Antifas, these Black Lives Matter, these Marxist communists, you know, these poverty pimps and everybody else. They're all children, they're all works of the devil. I told somebody today when they talk about, they hear the expression, we are all children of God. That's not, that's not true. It sounds nice, it sounds cute, but it's not true. And I'll tell you why. The truth of the matter is, we are all creations of God. God is no respecter of persons. He is our creator. He tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and God created man and woman on the earth. He tells us that in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. But we are not all children of God until we are born again. Hello, somebody. Jesus made it clear when he talked to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't say it'd be a nice idea if you was. <laughs> he says you must be born again. For unless a man is born again, he shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, starting in verse 31, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Jewish people came back and says, we are children of Abraham. Jesus said, no, you're not. Because if you were true children of Abraham, you would hear and obey me. But you can't hear my words, Jesus said, because you're not his children. You are of your father, the devil. That's what Jesus said, y'all. So, so, so some of us who have this idea about a cute Jesus... He's all love, but he's also all wrath and all judgment. He says, your father is the devil, and the lust of your father you shall do. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And then I'll add Reverend Kraft's piece on that, and so are you. So this nonsense about we're all children of God, that's not true. We are not all children of God until we confess and profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because he is in our hearts. There are two Adams. The first Adam who was born in sin. Adam was born, him and Eve, in a paradise. And they blew it in paradise. Yet Jesus, who is God and the Son of God, went out into the wilderness. And yet he was victorious in the wilderness. We are children of God when we've made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. And if we had not made him Lord and Savior, we are children of the devil. People don't want to hear that. But that's what the word of God teaches us and that's the truth. So don't let anybody tell you a slick lie about we're all children of God. In that case, Hitler was a child of God. And you know that's a lie? No. 
We are children of God when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and are born again and washed in the blood of Jesus and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then and only then are we children of God. Hello, somebody. Amen. See, we got too much false preaching today out here. It's just like when you hear all these brake spaders talking about, oh, how that, that constitution, that was oh, oh, oh antiquated doctrine that was written by old white men with stocking caps on their head and, and potted wigs, and they were all slaveholders. How many of you have heard that one? Yeah. The truth of the matter was most of them wasn't slaveholders because they didn't have enough money to own slaves. And the ones that were slaveholders, white men, and the, the abolitionists who were Christians knew that chattel slavery was nothing but, but kidnapping, which is a capital offense. And it was the abolitionists who came back and set the captives free. So if I'm going to talk about the white man who put us in slavery, we better give some kudos to the white man who brought us out. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Don't tell half the story. Tell the whole nine yards or keep your mouth shut and don't say nothing. You're going to tell half the story. Mm -hmm. eh? It's just like when I was coming up, I never understood the part of the story that said, oh, the white man went over there in Africa and got them poor black folks and put them on ships and brought them across the Atlantic, kept going back. How that happen? What they know about Western Africa? The truth of the matter was the African chiefs who basically were Muslims would capture other African tribes and hold them hostage and then when the white man found out there was money to be made off of slavery went over there and bought them and bought them back. So if I'm going to tell some of the story, I better tell it all. Yeah. Eh? But you don't hear that part. What about you see these banners out here? What about all the slavery that's going on as we sit right here in this room? Why we ain't talking about that? Mm -hmm. This thing is nothing but game, y'all. But it's a serious game because it got people at each other's throats. Uh, and what we talk about, we need to talk about racial reconciliation. We ain't got to talk about nothing. Get born again, you already be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to talk about it. I ain't talking about it with nobody because I know they already know the truth. But because they're children of their father, the devil, I don't care how much talking you do. You can talk until, the, until your tongue drops out. And if somebody don't want to hear the truth, they ain't going to listen to you. But Jesus said those of you that are of the truth will hear the truth and will obey it. Amen. Okay? What I want to challenge all of us up in here even just today, in the substance we heard today, this morning, with Brother Newman, and then what we heard with Dr. Nace, and then what we heard, the, the, the third one, with everything we heard today, let us know that you people in here learn more in one day than most of the people learn in 50 years. Am I right about it? Hello, somebody. Hey, this stuff's not rocket science. It really is not. But it's an agenda. And it's a wicked agenda. Because it's true, it's always been true, that to kill a nation, you divide the people. You divide them by race. You divide them by culture. You divide them by sex. You divide them by class. You divide, you divide, you divide. When I was a student at Harvard Divinity School back in the mid-90s, and it's, I know it's really bad now, they told us that all of our research, all of our analysis had to be done on race, class, and gender. Uh -huh. You divide them by race, oh, the blacks, the whites. You divide them by gender, back then it was male, female. Now it's male, female, and everything in between. Hello, somebody. Uh -huh. Whatever that means. And class, the haves and the have nots. So I'm supposed to take some poor white person from Appalachia, he's in a, living in a trailer park, he's a have-not, and some rich Colin Kaepernick or Oprah Winfrey, they, 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 I mean, they, they the have-nots, and somebody living in the trailer park who came up on the wrong side of the mountain, whose skin happens to be white, he's the haves. 
That white privilege nonsense. What difference is it black privilege and white privilege? It's all evil. It's all mess. Eh? I told somebody the other day, you're going to talk about oh, white privilege, well then why, why you don't have black privilege? Huh? Huh? Why not? What's all this selectivity nonsense? The devil knows that he's always been able to use slavery to stir people up and use culture and use race to get people at each other's throats. But if you tell people the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, who has washed us clean from our sins uh, on his death on the cross uh, and has made into two bodies one, uh, if we understand that and give our lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, boom, we don't need near another seminar. Yeah. So what's the answer to all this madness? The gospel is the answer. Not no religiosity, not no churchanity, not some cute Jesus tiptoeing through the tulips with a flower in his hair, but the real Jesus. The real Jesus. The real Jesus that hung on the cross for our sins, but that same real Jesus turned over the table of the money changers. That same Jesus that was born as a baby in Mary's womb is the same Jesus that's coming back one day riding on a white horse with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's the same Jesus. The same Jesus that said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life is the same Jesus that says, do not fear man who can kill your body and after that has no more that he can do unto you. But I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him who has the power that after he kills your body has the power to damn your soul in hell forever. Fear him. Same Jesus. Same Jesus. Ain't no two Jesuses. Same Jesus. That's why all of us have to get into the word of God. We can't cherry pick the word. We can't take the scriptures that are cute and that we like and set aside the rest of them. The reason why this, this mess about this one world government. You heard all them clips Mr. Uh, Newsom paid today. This one world government is coming. We can't stop it. How do we know that? God said it in the Bible. He said it in the Old Testament in Daniel. He said it in the New Testament in Revelations. It's going to happen. But he didn't tell us to sit and wring our hands and, and fear. He said, occupy until I show up on the scene. Occupy. What does that mean to occupy? It means to get in a fight. It means to love your life even if it unto death if necessary. Jesus says if you love mother, love father, love sister or love brother or love husband or wife or love your own life, even your own life more than you love me. Jesus said you're not worthy of me. Same Jesus. Huh? Same Jesus. Start reading some of the hard sayings of Jesus. Eh? Not all that cute stuff. Some of the things we don't want to talk about. Same Jesus. The hard sayings of Jesus. Read some of those, some of those words of Jesus. Because eh? brothers and sisters, this mess is dangerous. Satan is going for the juggler. And he's not even hiding it anymore. He's in our face. And we got to push back and push back hard. How do we know that? The same Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 16, he said upon this rock. What rock? The rock of revelation knowledge. Where did that rock come from? In, in, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked the, the 12 disciples, who do men say I am? Some of them said, are you John the Baptist? Others said, are you Elijah? Others said, you Isaiah, one of the prophets. Jesus said, oh, that's good, old boys. Well, who do you all guys say I am? 
Peter rose up and says, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God. Jesus looked at Peter. He said, you right, my man. <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because people, flesh and blood, didn't tell you that. But my father, which is in heaven, and upon that rock, <laughs> what rock? The rock of revelation knowledge. I will build my church, says the Lord, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is Jesus saying to us today? Stop wringing our hands as believers. Start pressing against the enemy. Tell the devil enough's enough. Uh, instead of sitting back to it, oh, what we gonna do, Reverend Craft? The Lord already told us what to do. Uh, start storming the gates of hell. Uh, start telling that devil we had enough. Uh, start telling that devil we're coming in and knocking down the gates of hell uh, in order that we can set the captives free. Uh, and as we get that backbone inside of us, that spiritual spine that God requires because he told us in the book of Revelations, he says the first ones that are going to bust hell wide open are the fearful. That's Jesus. Read it. Jesus said, if you're a coward, you're going to hell. So Reverend Kraft wants to encourage all of us. You come to these camps every year, you learn more in one week then all that nonsense you hear, oh yeah, them lies out there. Take what you learn in here. Become disciples of Jesus Christ. And be able like Deborah, not Deborah, like Esther said. I'm going into the king without being invited. And if I die, I die. God bless you. God bless you.